Daydream Society. One. I've developed a habit recently of making art out of clippings from the newspaper obituaries. I slice single words out from their surrounding bodies, deprive them of context, and then rearrange these amputations into some kind of poetic verse. Sometimes I arrange them on the wood floor of my apartment, in a spiral pattern, following the order of death. I manipulate the obituaries to say, Neural riots wake the shadow of dream highs. My fingers get sticky with glue and stained from the rubbed off ink. Obituaries are strange. There's a black and white photograph of the deceased. It's before they disappeared, no longer really a picture of them. It's a delineation of the structure their cells once formed, mapped out by a genetic predisposition. A structure once rocked by the persistent life energy that had propelled them into motion, propelled them to wake in the morning, rub their sore back, begin their day. The body's no longer relevant to the deceased. That bird has flown. The picture itself is a kind of motion capture of the life in memorial. A still shot clipped from the unlimited reel of experience. Undoubtedly, the moment between the flash and photo capture could never accurately portray the totality of the existence of a being. And yet, we like to pretend. If we were geared to perceive our everyday experiences in the vein of obituaries, our memory would jump, like stop motion video. From one to the next, the space in between, void of form or definition, is something we can't allow ourselves to recognize. The written obit, encapsulating and reposed below the mugshot, remains at a comfortable distance from any emotional judgments. Cindy Blue passed away on November 7th. She is survived by her mother Dorian Blue and half-brother Louis Fitzgerald. She spent most of her life in the city of New Orleans, where she may have been an artist, although we're not sure, since art is essentially subjective. Friends and relatives are invited to attend the funeral mass. This predilection towards stating only objective facts underscores a tacit, although shy, admission of the complexities of perception. No two people think exactly alike. While we'd like to say we do, while aging hippies rave on about the universal mind, and psychonauts rock on their heels in dank basement apartments, whispering they can read our thoughts, the truth of it remains. When we gaze too long into the sun, each of us sees different colors. I drop the scissors and let the obituary clippings blow restlessly across my floor because I have to meet Marcel at a coffee shop. Marcel is scratching at his rusted brown hair ambivalently. He's got that expression on his face again. One eyeball vaguely strays from the other, off into the left. I catch myself musing if Marcel's straying eye is searching for some kind of dysfunction in the left hemisphere of his brain, a crucial break in the logical faculty, searching for some answer he can't explain. Satsuma's busy. People crowd around each other on the pockmarked patio chairs, clutching porcelain plates of runny eggs and sausage, wilted sheets of cilantro. Forks clink on these plates dispassionately. Coffee mugs seem to collapse under the shade of magnolia branches like monuments to an outdated god. The rotting wooden fence around the patio gives a sparse sanctuary from the harsher concrete of the uneven street outside. Marcel and I are hunched over Café au lait in a corner of the place. How's the apartment working out? I ask him. He's been leasing the apartment below mine for three months now. A solid wooden affair, sharing a wall with a stucco pawn shop on the first floor. When Marcel is painting, he's a monk. His frenetic otherworldliness cusses itself out onto canvas, releasing something in order to balance itself. Nerves and ideas calm themselves over time in paint strokes. It wouldn't shock me to watch him tear his eyeball out and superglue it to the blank page. He etches at the blood with a bent fingernail, scraping it into some semblance of a conclusion. 
myself falls apart all over canvas. It's odd, he remarks. An awkward pause, and I can hear his breath quicken. I was lying in bed last night, trying to crash out. He stops again. Aw, uh, I don't know. Come on, I yawn, sipping the hot coffee. From across the fence we can hear a grifter mumbling something at a passerby. A jagged, comfortable rhythm. So I'm in my room, trying to sleep. And I hear a fucking voice screaming across the house. Did you hear it? Around one, maybe? I can't say that I noticed anything. Yes, Marcel insists, giving a deadpan look. They didn't want you to. Maybe. He obviously believes his story. Maybe the paint fumes have got to his head. What's this voice screaming about, I ask. At this, Marcel's eyes grow downcast. I'm not sure, something about tomorrow and yesterday. Tomorrow? What exactly about tomorrow? I don't know, it's confusing. I can see that Marcel isn't about to open up about the specifics. So I ask him if it wasn't maybe a neighbor or domestic disturbance which he has misinterpreted the importance of. No, Marcel insists. The voice was yelling at him and him alone. The voice was trying to communicate something to him. I think, muses the painter, there's something seriously wrong with the world. I don't know what to say to something like this. The coffee shop door swings shut behind me with an elaborate thump. My copy of the Daydream Society feels jagged in my back pocket, not yet worn enough to carry comfortably. The air on the street is muggy, but there's a slight breeze. The sun beats down, drying up grass as it tries to make something of itself in sliver cracks of sidewalk. People shrink against the brick walls under awnings. My shoes slap slap as I walk. Ahead of me on the street stumbles what looks to be a derelict homeless, decorated in a patchwork jacket and what must once have been Sunday best pinstriped pants. As I pass closer to him, he seems to stare me down from underneath the brim of a floppy hat that has long ago lost its shape. I see a small visible area of face, covered by tangled hair. His clothes and backpack seem dusted in dried river mud. I catch myself contemplating the worn threads of the hobo's attire for a second too long, when a woman, walking faster than myself, passes me on my left. She's wearing a white button shirt and black skirt and jacket ensemble. Her gaze is planted fixedly ahead, and she's on a straight collision course with the shabby bum. What happens next grabs me by the lungs, my guts clench. Stepping lightly to avoid an uneven break in the sidewalk, the woman collides with the bum and passes right through him. As this is happening, I see the bum shudder, a violent spasm that shakes him from his arm down to his toes. His rat's nest of a beard shakes with the rest of him. After a second, the bum quiets down. I'm caught, standing on the sun-scorched sidewalk with a kind of dead stare. Recognition passes silently there, between the two of us. The recognition of humanity, the compassion shared by beggars and saints. I feel my breaths like quiet whispers, and I'm sure the bum can hear them. I can see for a moment, in the shade under his hat, almost pupilless eyes, pulsing black. In a chaos of now, I see him beginning to steal toward me, shuffling with slow, painful steps. I startle out of this reverie and step aside. Off the sidewalk, the figure shuffles past me. I can hear the audible ticking of a pocket watch, all recognition lost, his attention cast ahead of him. He passes me, forgotten. When I turn around instinctively to see where he was going, he's gone. In a state of confusion, I run to the alley that traces out the back patio of Satsuma looking for him. No, he's gone. Sun induced hallucinations, my bitch.